things, why would somebody not be interested in you? And so Professor Obia, who had developed interest in me from 300 level, gave me a topic in my final. And the topic was to find out why the drug amphetamine, which is a drug of abuse, all right, had a property called um, stereotypy. You know, and that can be defined as repeating a particular action, albeit inappropriate in the environment. And when that happens, you say the person don't go low. And amphetamine can is a drug we use in the laboratory to induce psychosis. And there's also another property as well with amphetamine, that's tolerance. And look at this, that's amphetamine. For the core scientists here, it's something referred to as K1 metabolism. So these are our products, K1 metabolism. And that's amphetamine. So in final year, I used this drug called Proadipen, MCL 55 And this MCL 55 injected. We also know that football experts are capable of inhibiting the um, formation of cytokines, and that has caused the basis for why they are that effective, and so possible modulation, modulation of the permanent pathways. Now, I had had the dream of being a neuropharmacologist in the light of Roger Macondjola, psychiatric neuropharmacologist. I wanted to be in the category of postal and Nilo. You know, sharp and ungastered. These were the top names then in neuropharmacology. But impaired by the socioeconomic circumstances, I left Nigeria and more or less I became Rudales. It was in that Rudalessness that Professor, Professor Ambrose Issa and then Professor E.K. Ayamubai, they came to me and said, Oh boy, are you just going to remain like this? Within the time, people were using Indometacin, you know, Indusin, and we're using it to kill rats. Was something wrong during the preclinical evaluation of endometriosis? That was a question. So they gave to me as my MSc thesis to investigate endometriosis some more and find out the basis for its use as a rodenticide. Now, we determined the LD50, and that's the that kills 50% of the population of rats, and we studied the mechanism of its toxicity. Our LD50 value was almost the same as what had been reported in the literature. Death was due to fatal peritonitis. And the rats took much more than the body could handle. Now the basis. But I did what we call bile dot ligation. I did surgery in the rats, tied up the bile dots, and we found that that prevented death. In other words, you can, hand, you can, you 
they could think, think out and, and the repatriate recycling as the basis for the toxicity uh, caused by endometriosis in the rats. The practice then was to add diazepam, that's million five, with indocid, in the claim that it will kill the rats the more. We found that adding diazepam was of no consequence. Omobite et al. 1999, Omobite et al. 2002. That first publication, Omobite et al. 1999, became the referral material for the American Pest Control Agency for several years. On the ecology, you see, Professor, my friend Professor Okuli came to me and said, Why don't we? Nobody knows, knows what uh, this uh, acetylene, acetylene gas that uh, whether she would be the effect it may have on their body. Okay? So we simulated an experiment in which we reacted calcium carbide, that's what happens, that's what they do with water, and then they form acetylene, that's acetylene there. And then the rabbits inhale this acetylene, and then we checked certain parameter. We found that there was elevation in AST and ALT. These two enzymes, aspartic transaminase and uh, alanine transaminase, are used as indices for showing whether the liver is healthy or not healthy. If they are high, that means that something is wrong with the liver. But elevation means that something certainly went wrong with the liver of those rabbits. And then there was also reduction in BCB. Our conclusion, we concluded that the use of these two acetylene may be associated so some fastidious persons here may want to ask it, why did we not try this experiment in humans? Well, it would have been nice, but you know so well that taking blood from humans in Nigeria is often very difficult because of ritualistic imputation that's given to those such experiments. So we're limited. If somebody is sitting beside you, please agitate the person, tell the person to be alert. Why so? Yes, in the manner of pastors, be alert. Now, why so? Because what is talking about hypertension, cardiovascular and hematological studies, these are areas I, I took very de 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 delightfully. Now, persistent increase in blood pressure above normal is what is referred to as what? Hypertension. And then blood pressure is given by that equation, cardiac vascular times total peripheral resistance. And look at this thing, these three uh, factors. Blood volume, heart rate, and diameter of blood vessels. These are three key factors. So the drugs that we are using for treatment of hypertension works in one or more of these three ways. And so, for if you are using a diuretic, the idea with the diuretic is to reduce cardiac output. If you are going doing exercises, you also want to cause dilatation of the blood vessels, all right? You also want uh, the cardiac output to fall on account of sweating persistently, and so on and so forth. But almost always, drugs that are used in treatment of hypertension have something in common. All of them, they cause vessel dilatation. They make the blood vessels to, to become dilated. Let me put it simply this way. The pressure of water in your kitchen will depend on how much water is in the overhead tank above. It will also depend on, if you are using the pump, how efficient that pump is, whether the pump is working very fast, the rate that it comes out. It also will depend on the size of the pipe that supplies water to your kitchen. If the pipe is wide in diameter, it is very likely that the pressure in the kitchen will fall very low. And so that is what you have. When the blood, when the blood vessel is dilated, we say there is reduction in total peripheral resistance. And so that is the target in seeking to treat hypertension. So a situation of high total peripheral resistance, which is like squeezing the nozzle of your host so that the pressure will go further when you are watering your edges. You know, will not arise. That's not acceptable. That will mean increase in blood pressure. Let's go some more. Clotting of blood. This is a very useful process that God has put in all of us. If we didn't have it in us, we would bleed to death from all sorts of bodily acids. Conversely, abnormal clotting can also be dangerous because it can result in occlusion of blood vessels. And that means denial of uh, nutrient and oxygen to the cells that ought to be supplied. Internal clots are usually referred to as um, thrombi, but they can be dislodged from where they've been formed, and when that happens, they become emboli. And that leads us to a phenomenon known as thromboembolism. And it's a major cause of sudden death from heart attack and stroke. Two factors, platelet aggregation and viscosity of blood, are uh, key to determine the presupposition to um, thromboembolism. 
Look at this first one. That is your blood vessel when you were young. Very clean. Look at the lumen. Very, very clean. Now, later on, it's not so clean. Sorry? Later on, it is not so clean. Oh, dear. Later on, it's not so clean. It's, it's not so clean. And you will find that the interior, is, uh, there are plaques inside. Those plaques are avoided. When the doctors tell you, hepocas tell you that you avoid excess cholesterol, that's exactly what they are aiming at. That this does not happen. Why? You see, the orifice has become narrow, and that means the blood pressure can rise. Aside from that, that the plaque is there means there's a higher tendency for clots to form, and you can suffer heart attack and what have you. So doctors will advise you to avoid this. Look at that. I hope it's sharp wherever you are. That's the platelet. That platelet is in the blood, in your blood. But you will not see this ordinarily with the naked eye. It has hands. With those hands, they able to attract, you know, meet with other platelets and form a clot. So platelet aggregation is key to form the formation of a clot. Now let's move further. Professor LFO Obika, who saw some academic promise in me, introduced me to a, pro a protocol referred to potassium, as potassium adaptation. And that means giving 0.75% potassium chloride for a few weeks. Some persons refer to this as adapt as a supplementation, but it is indeed supplementation that results in adaptation. And this was the trust of my PhD work. Then this supervised by two great men, Professor E.P. Adamobai and Professor A.B. Begwin. And so we found that adapting the rats to potassium reduced the ability of the platelets to aggregate. We also found that it did not alter the viscosity of whole blood and plasma. And then we published our findings in a very reputable journal, which to me was a fantastic achievement, because I could not imagine publishing in that journal. And that was October 2002. October 2002. Now, after that publication, I have sought to introduce a concept known as hemopharmacology. Please keep this in mind. Every concept you know that you have heard of was introduced, coined by somebody or group of persons. So one day to coin something called hemopharmacology, that would mean effect of drugs on the, the, in the cells of the blood. But this was not to be. We lacked a vital instrument for investigating this, something called agriculture. I was in the University of Southampton for a conference uh, sent by Professor Abeke. University of Southampton, and one professor promised that he was going to send the anabigometer to us, but he never did. But some persons in the U.S. see the work we have done on potassium adaptation, more or less, took the wind out of our seed and published a fantastic article, and that is Chimera et al. And indeed, this was very displeasing to us. We wish we were the one to report the effect. Now, the graph you see, just what I have told you, we may skip this, you will see this in the booklet being circulated. Now, uh, there have been issues whether potassium adaptation or supplementation causes a fall in blood pressure. In pharmacology, you reduce the disease state first and see whether the, 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 the intervention will address the particular disease you are talking about. So I have to induce hypertension using what referred to as the gamma process. And for those who are doctors here and those who understand, we talk about the unilateral nephrotomy with figure eight ligature of the contralateral kidney. If you do that, it will trigger the renin and the testing aldosterone system, and then there's elevation of blood pressure. We did that, and we found that adaptation actually reduced blood pressure, and it reduced responses of medium that provoke rise in blood pressure. I'm going buy it all 2005. And that's what I've just told you. Adapted, look at the mean arterial pressure, look at what has, it has become. Then we took blood vessels, a conduit pipe. Well, that's the one we could work with in the rats, the aorta. And assay two enzymes, two key enzymes, superiorized discretase and sodium potassium ATPase. Our finding, look at this, there's elevation in the adapted of SOD elevation in um, sodium potassium ATPase. And so, is anybody here using amlodipine? I don't want to call the brand name. Don't raise your hand. Using amlodipine or nifedipine. You may well be using any of this. This is 
how that drug works. It blocks these so uh, calcium channels. And so calcium does not flow into the cell. On a normal day, calcium flows into the cell. And that calcium induces the release of calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. The sarcoplasmic reticulum, I tell my students, they refer, they refer to as the calcium bank, the storehouse of the cell. In other cells, it's called endoplasmic reticulum. And then more calcium is available in the cytosol. And this calcium is now given to the active myosin. So what amlodipine does is to block this calcium channel. And so where does supplementation, adaptation, which we are studying, where does it fall in the equation? That's how, that's how it is. That's adaptation, right? Activating sodium potassium ATPase. Activation of that membrane band enzyme results in the opening of potassium channel. Potassium effluxes flows out of the cell, resulting in hyperpolarization. In hyperpolarized cell, calcium channels are blocked. So calcium does not flow into the cell, and then there is a fall in blood pressure. And then look at the other arm of the mechanism. That's potassium supplementation. Activating sodium potassium and uh, superoxide dispetase. Superoxide dispetase increases nitric oxide level. Nitric oxide on the toe causes increased open state mobility of potassium channels, and then there is hyperpolarization, and then the cell refuses to contract. Uh, it, it, it relaxes, and that's the basis for why it's used as, uh, uh, in hypertension. Now, see, so uh, the nitric oxide donors. Um, sodium nitroposide, uh, glyceride trinitrate, glyceride uh, isosorbide dinitrate, three morpholetosindoimine, and what have you. All of these can directly donate nitric oxide and cause opening of potassium channels. But there are also drugs that directly open potassium channels on their own. For example, leftomacaline, minosidine, nicoradine. All these are drugs that are used in uh, hypertension and uh, um, other myocardial ischemic conditions. So. Are you a biochemist? Are you a physiologist? Are you a scientist? We could have stopped at the level of saying, okay, potassium adaptation causes a fall in blood pressure. But ladies and gentlemen, to this audience, the more you know, the more you know. Now, you are not likely to give somebody potassium. I ask the physicians here, how do you give somebody potassium? Say, take, and this will reduce your blood pressure. The average doctor will be afraid of something called polymorphic tachycardia, associated with excess uh, with potassium use. So you know, that's a no-go area. You have to go. So over all over the world, nobody was keen in giving potassium directly for purposes of reduction in blood pressure. But clinicians, healthcare providers know of something called DASH. DASH is an acronym, dietary approach for stopping hypertension. So what did we have to do? We were looking at our local foods and see which of them has potassium that we can encourage people to eat. And so we went on using plain atomic absorption spectroscopy. We determined the potassium content of some basic plant foods around. That's carrots. You see the potassium content? Very, very high. And that's plantain too, isn't it? But contrary to what some persons, uh, persons think, think, that's uh, potassium that the egg. You see the potassium content not so high. So what did we do? We took um, garlic egg and plantain, rice plantain that is. We fed this to rats for 28 days. And what was our finding? Look at the mean arterial pressure. Well, not significantly reduced. But look at this. We challenged the rats with both of doses of noradrenaline. That's the drug that should cause increase in blood pressure. We found that there was attenuation in response by one given uh, plantain and given carrot. And then look at this. We again challenge those rats with drugs that ought to reduce blood pressure. Something called verapamil, another one called sodium nitroposide. We found that the ones given carrot had enhanced decrease in blood pressure. And so what would be the deliverables, the summary of all of this? That eating these foods and vegetables may reduce what? Blood pressure. And next,
You know, we're here now, the, the thing cures Pantlococcus anus. That's the pronunciation. Pantlococcus anus. And most of them have become Togo Niche. And you know what Togo Niche is? A kind of silver, silver bullet, okay? Uh -huh. That reminds us of uh, the elusive Elisa of the medieval ages that uh, people were supposed to take. You know, we read medieval history. The, the, after that, is uh, nothing is said. You know, uh, you take this Elisa and then people will live forever. So we were a bit tardy. But look at this. One man kept coming to my office. To him, Okono, he did. Dr. Ray, Okono, they treat, he did treat diabetes. If he had said Okono can control diabetes, maybe that would make me encourage me. But for those of us, we know so well. He's not talking about curing the that with cure. Okono, they cure diabetes. For those of us who know what Now look at this plant. 
Anogamous paniculata is also referred to as the king of bitters. Mr. Vice Chancellor, the depth of investigation, of investigation, the number of investigations of this plant is overwhelming. From anti asthma to anti virus activities. You know, I, Professor, Venerable Professor Mohammed Jan invited me to his house. I went uh, to his house and then we strolled into his garden and he showed me a particular plant which he said to me that he often made a portion of and he drank. I said, Sir, do you know this plant? Has anybody ever mentioned it to you? He said, Well, I just felt it was good for. Ah. And I turned to him and said, Venerable Professor Mohammed Jan, flesh and blood did not reveal this to you. <laughs> That plant is Androgamis paniculata. We have found that the aqueous extract relaxes tracker, um, and this action involves in vision of calcium influx into airways food muscle, but does not possess cyclopositivity in inhibitory property. Also, I thought 2009A, also, I thought uh, 2011C, also, I thought 2011D. All right, all of these graphs are just to su uh, support what I've said to you. You know, that's from the uh, a guinea pig given the extract compared to the one not given the extract. The difference between A and B is that carbacol was used to reduce contraction here. This one was used to introduce uh, this contraction. That's maximum cost of contraction. And this one, yes, ladies and gentlemen, the more you look, the more you see. And we looked for more for that, we found that that aqueous extract actually prevents calcium inflows into the spoon muscles of the airways, and that's the basis for causing uh, bronchodilatation. Right? Let's fast forward. We know this. That's beta cola. The thing now means so many things to many people. And I'm told that the price of beta cola has soured, has increased in recent times. Am I right? Yes. The thing has increased. Well, uh, Professor Buster Grillo of Anatomy, the woman came to my office. It's the Asthmatic property of Garcinia cura, particularly with respect to the histology. This is an anatomist now, with respect to the histology. So we went to work and we found that the thing reduces the characteristic inflammation often associated with chronic asthma, only pre mildly prevents acute bronchospasm. In other words, if somebody is asthmatic and you give the beta cola, it's not likely to work, but used continuously, it may be helpful. You know, these days, internet says, for the world has become a global village. And so one senior advocate of Nigeria, permit me not to mention his name, called me from Abuja because he read our paper from uh, Bob Ment. And they, of course, there, the corresponding author's name and address was there. And he called me. And he said to me that he had eaten two seeds daily in the past two years and had had no need for his inhalers. Granted that he ensured that the inhalers were always ready and then none expired on him. He said so, but he had a worry. The worry was there was reduction in libido. <laughs> now, the effect, don't make any you and cry over this. The effect of metatola on libido has been, you know, varied. Some scientists will say it promotes libido, some others will say it decreases libido. Ray also like not involved in sexual. <laughs> of Nigeria said to me, he said, well, granted that it reduced libido, that a living dog is better than a dead lion. So we was going to continue to the dog. So here we are. With respect to cough, with respect to cough, it suppresses cough, reduces mucus secretion, possibly due to the very high tannin content, blood development of hypercholesterol in rats. And we also found that this thing, it has in the way, similar to cholesterol, which is a bile uh, acid See, that's um, Garcinia cola. 92% inhibition of cough compared to DF-118, which is the standard. Right? Well, we can dispute this. We just simply want to say to you here that garlic, we investigated, investigated and found that garlic has anti hypertensive effect. We also found that um, that's our soft, isn't it? Has anti hypertensive effect. This one is Cosimum gratissimum. In Ura, we call it Ebu Amon cough. Benin has a the name in Benin is similar, isn't it? Uh, Professor Olomu came to me and said, Ray, 
that this thing investigate these plants that they didn't have anti-asthmatic property. Well, we found that it did not have any anti-asthmatic property. Instead, very, very potent in inhibiting cough, in relieving cough. Now, there's a missing here. There's something cough that may be associated with asthma. So if that cough associated with asthma is relieved in the asthmatic, somebody may be tempted to think that the thing has anti-asthmatic property. That is not it. It does not have anti-asthmatic property, but it relieves cough. Osimum, gratissimo. Now, we've done so many other studies. I, I have pleaded with my postgraduate students, and I have said from the outset, and other collaborators for that matter, that we, what we are doing, what I'm doing, I'm trying to account for at the year 2011, when I was elevated by the grace of uh, God through Professor Oji Oshodi to become a professor. And that was at 2011. So the bulk of my publication what I present is as at 2011. So you have some several publications between 2007 and 2018. They are not reflected here. Because you know you don't begin to shift and just the goalposts after the ball is in play. So there are so many other studies that involve us. I plead again with my postgraduate students uh, if their work is not reflected in this presentation. So all of this, all of that, all of that. But let me look at let's look at this mushroom. Uh, Professor Okoya, I'm sure you will you take interest in uh, that mushroom. And that is Vitoros tuberegum. Professor Vincent Yahweh sent his postgraduate student, doctoral student, to me. They had observed that the, the plant extract was able to reduce intraocular pressure. Ladies and gentlemen, the more you know, the more you see. And so they wanted me to help them understand the mechanism, the basis for it. And we look at the guidance that we had. There is no one who checked in the literature. Nowhere in the literature had anybody used the kind of rudimentary guidance available in my laboratory. But necessity, they say, is the mother of invention. So we went to work. So we took eyes from cow, and then we took out the iris nozzle. Now, you know, you don't know how sophisticated the iris is. You look at your neighbor's eyes, there's a black spot. Okay, that's a pupil. In that pupil, you see something like a mesh. That's the iris. And so we isolated this, and we checked, and we found that the mushroom extract caused contraction of the circular smooth muscles of the iris. If it does that to the circular smooth muscles of the iris, then it causes meiosis. If it causes meiosis, then chances are that it opens the drainage angle. And if it opens the drainage angle, then there is enhancement of flow of aqueous simum through the trabecular stretch into the canal of spine. Professor Kode, you are here. That part here, you remember, that our, that our student. And that's... Uh, and the of the Okapa on base sexuality. Let's not go there. Uratachi, let's not go there. Okay. Now, the key question is are these plants extracts ever always safe? The answer is no. I mean, doctors tell us that many of the cases of renal shutdown that they find in the hospital often due to people using herbal extracts. And only an irresponsible government, we are now, you know, the plants known only to herbalists and maybe to some wild animals in the bush to be packaged and given out to people to be taken as medicine. So it's routine in my laboratory that for every drug that we evaluate for curative purposes, we also evaluate for safety purposes. So you have so many publications on account of this, and I can tell you, Mr. Vice Chancellor, you see, this is forward now. Any of this paper here, anybody that is in the internet, all you just need to do is to Google and then it will come out and they go to certain site and we will tell you number of people who have cited that work a number of persons who have read the work so it's you do and i can just put it this way without sense of modesty that our format for investing, investigating the safety of herbal medicine has been adopted by very many laboratories across the world <laughs> and so am i just working on plants and all of that far from it I've also been involved in clinical studies. And so with uh, Professor Iyalumi, then our student with Professor Mumbai, we had investigated volume blood pressure responses about chemical parameters of hypertensive that have been placed on diuretics. Iyalumi had taught 2006, Iyalumi had taught 2007, Iyalumi had taught 2008. We have also uh, investigated the analgesic effectiveness of doses of paracetamol and ibuprofen in dental pain model, also uh, a diet at all 2008. 
And when with Professor Omoti and others, we have made statements about drug management in open and glaucoma. Now, my profession, I'm first and foremost a pharmacist and a very confident one at that. And I can tell you that I have reflected from a good training and practice my services in the Federal Ministry of Health, health agencies, and now that um, World Health Organization and what have you. I'm, I'm, I consult for the Pharmacist Council on a regular basis and um, uh, almost on a regular basis, scheduled address delivery from one state of the branch of PSN to another. But there are two that I need to bring out here. There's something called the National Pharmacopetulance Policy. Myself and Professor um, Ambrose Issa, we formulated that policy for the federal government and its innovation. The essential, and uh, also uh, in the essential medicine list and standard treatment guideline committee of the federal ministry of health. Put it this way, by the grace of God, and yes, I'm a pharmacist, every drug you take, God has given me the opportunity to be one of the persons to determine whether the drug should be available in Nigeria or should not. Now, reviewing my adventure, you will have observed that I have worked in neuropharmacology, cardiovascular pharmacology, ethnopharmacology, toxicology, clinical studies. But you know what? The secret of success is what? Constancy of purpose. That's the opinion of Benjamin Disraeli, one time British uh, statesman. I wish I was visited tenaciously to just one aspect of these studies. It would have been fantastic. But, like I said, at some point, necessity is what? The mother of prevention. If there is no electricity for you to do cardiovascular studies, would you just hold your hands and then become miserable? No, not. You find something to do. So in such circumstances, I do remember the words of Shakespeare. And I for those of us who read Shakespeare, Macbeth. You know, when Macbeth was overwhelmed, all the predictions by the, by the witches were falling into places. And he said, made the statement that I have been tied to the stake. I cannot free, but be alive, I will fight the cause. That is the mental state, that is the mindset with which I tackle my responsibilities in research and academics. I have tried. I have tried to justify my elevation to the position of a professor of pharmacology. I have also tried to show that the more we look into drug actions, the more fascinating and intriguing our findings. This is true of every genuine research and evil. I have, even before my promotion to the rank of professor, served as an academic ambassador within and outside Nigeria. Thus, my status as a professor has been earned, my restlessness in various research and develop, notwithstanding. But I'm restless. You can tell that I'm restless. You can see that I move from one aspect of the subject area to the other. Yes, I'm restless. I'm restless because the facilities are few and hardly functional. I'm restless because I born with the desire to make fundamental contributions to the subject and place my investment in the world map of pharmacology. I'm restless because I refuse to be dejected, disenchanted and disillusioned by the prevailing Ooh. situation. Until Nigeria realizes the place of pharmacological yeah. research in national growth by addressing the following recommendation. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Vice Chancellor, I remain restless. resulted in a book which the uh, which third one is uh, funded. We thought we should allow third one to publish the book so that the price can come down. That with that book, that the book there, edited by myself and Dr. Bafo, you know, we invited researchers, scientists, top scientists from within Nigeria and outside to contribute chapters. And that's our own best way of giving a shot in the arm to drop development and biomedical research in Nigeria. And so the book will soon be out. Now, look at these drugs that are here. That one costs $409,000. $409,500. That's about $140 million, isn't it? The cheapest is $250. The cheapest is $250,000. That's about $90 million. That's for a year treatment with each of these drugs. So in other words, if you were down, with the disease requiring this drug, you'll be looking for 140 million naira to buy the drug every day. And I can imagine some persons will say, if a man was involved, the wife and the children will go to him and say, well, why don't you just pass on? <laughs> so, 
we can spend 20 million to the prohibiting barrier, isn't it? And after the prohibiting barrier, the balance for uh, 120 million, the family can live happily ever after, isn't it? But that's not the negative angle from which I'm looking at this. Just imagine if Nigeria was the place for the production of these drugs, and other countries of the world were coming to Nigeria to solve. Ensuring constant availability of electricity and water. I don't want to go further. Every now and then we are subjected to mental torture for those of us who are about medical scientists. It's unthinkable. Then I also recommend that there should be sound teaching of science at all levels of education. From medicine to pharmacy, from Unipen to other schools, I have asked questions. I said to my students, how many of you here have seen sodium? Not many. My classmate in Holy Trinity would recall that back in the days, we would we play with sodium, we would throw sodium in water, the thing would dance and explode, and that would include the sodium hydroxide. Well, that was fascinating, but now they have never seen sodium. So it's possible for somebody to go from, you know, secondary to university to even become a professor, he had never seen sodium. <laughs> as, 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 They, they become what they are on account of promotion of clever medicine. We can commercialize our own, we can standardize and commercialize our own. That will reduce the employment problem we have and turn our economy around. Well, let me uh, touch the raw names of the medicalists if they are here. And how am I touching their raw names? I'm asking government to enforce the law that prevents the abandonment of fear for certain categories of diseases. Media houses should look elsewhere for ways of generating income. Don't come around, don't come around and say that uh, uh, you have a paper product, uh, the thing can cause this, it can do that, it can do this. On one occasion, my son will not remember, he asked me, he said, that last speaker, that man is always saying that if he gives you this person, mommy will clap for you in the morning. <laughs> I, said, I said to myself, I said, don't worry, son, your mommy is already clapping. evaluation of medicinal products. Acknowledgement. I want to thank the Vice Chancellor, Professor FFO Owensi, for giving me the opportunity to deliver this lecture. Put simply, there is a tie to the affairs of men. Again, that's Shakespeare. I want to thank the Deputy Vice Chancellor. I don't want to be naming them one by one. That will consume time. I'm already being served cards. Former Vice Chancellor. All of them have been like fathers to me. I know what Professor what they thinks of me and what he expects of me. Well, it's only God that can make certain things. If he's a prophet, then one of the days it will come to pass. But let's leave it at that. Prof, I'm grateful to you. You taught me at undergraduate level. You have always stood by me. Uh, that you have left where you are to come and uh, to come and uh, attend this lecture is something I don't take for granted. I also want to thank Professor Ochoji. You know, this time I met him. This time I met him with my request. I don't know, sometimes I have told people that in Senate, and those who know, I can be terribly outspoken. In Senate, I often take two positions, eh? opposing him. But a part never really took. <laughs> I don't know, maybe he, I don't know, sir. <laughs> he never really got angry with me. And if I said anything to him, he will approve anything for that matter. Bro, God bless you, sir. My post-graduate supervisors, yes, time is fast spent, but please, let's do this. Can, can Professor Ikea Mobile be outstanding, please? Um, <laughs> Professor, <laughs> Professor Ikea Mobile, <laughs> Professor Ambrosita, <laughs> please let me applaud.
honesty.
Yes, one Mr. Paul Omodiali. I don't know that uh, Ogapol is here. Ogapol, are you here? 